right. Hello, I'm Christian Stevenson with the Mississippi State University Extension Service in Hancock County. I'm joining you for another online presentation. I appreciate you being here today. And uh, I certainly also appreciate it if you are watching this uh, uh, on its recording that I put up on YouTube. Uh, if you are watching on YouTube, I would encourage you uh, if you have any questions uh, or any comments, you can put those down in the comments section. If you have a question, I'll be able to see that and come back and answer any questions that you might have. Uh, and I uh, certainly do appreciate you taking the time out of your day uh, to listen to this presentation. Uh, so today I am talking about primarily muscadines. I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on, uh, on grapes today. Uh, simply because for production here in the southeastern United States, uh, muscadines are, are certainly a lot more reliable in terms of being able to grow them in our backyards or even produce them on a large scale than would, uh, we would uh, have for, for other forms of grapes. Uh, so grapes are members of the family Vitaceae. Uh, Vitus is the genus uh, for that. Uh, and there are several species within that uh, that are used as uh, a, a fruit uh, for various purposes. Of course, I have to include a, a Van Gogh painting uh, for that simply because I, I enjoy that. Uh, but when we think about grapes and the grapes that we buy at the grocery store, most commonly uh, what we're dealing with there are bunch grapes or table grapes, so Vitus vinifera. Uh, and what we primarily grow in our backyards are going to be muscadines, uh, and that would be Vitus rotundifolia. Uh, so certainly uh, those two species are probably the, the most important uh, as far as uh, production and, and backyard gardening uh, for us here in the southeast. There are some other species of grapes that have been or are still used uh, in production a little bit, uh, though they don't tend to be produced on the large scale, uh, though there is a, an exception to that. I'm only going to mention two of those, and I'm, I'm not really going to go into any detail with these uh, because they're not very frequently grown uh, by themselves, uh, and they're very difficult to propagate uh, as a rule. Uh, Vitus estivalis, or the, the summer grape, uh, is one of those. Uh, in some cases, there are some crosses between different Vita species, um, but that is one that's native to the, uh, to the eastern United States uh, that uh, you know, has, uh, has some importance. A little bit more interestingly, there's Vitus labrusca. Uh, Vitus labrusca is also known as the fox grape. And uh, if you have ever heard of the term uh, it, referring to a wine as being boxy, kind of having a little bit of a musky taste to it. Uh, in fact, that, that is where we get that term from the fox grape. Uh, and the Concord grape is a form of Vitus labrusca. Uh, so these uh, uh, do have uh, some importance, but primarily uh, when we talk about grapes, we're referring to either the, the table grape or bunch grape, Vitus vinifera, uh, or the muscadine, uh, Vitus rotundifolia. Uh, just a kind of a historical note uh, about grape production. I'm going to talk a little bit more about some other insects later in the presentation. Um, but one insect has had a, a significant impact on grape production worldwide, uh, and that is grape phylloxera. Uh, now here in the southeast, we're prob probably also familiar with pecan phylloxera. Uh, this is uh, an insect in the same group. It's kind of like an aphid. Uh, and back in the 1850s, uh, these insects, which are native to North America, were introduced into Europe. Uh, and as a result of that, they, uh, they had the great French wine blight. Uh, there was damage to uh, other, you know, grape uh, production in other areas of Europe as well. Uh, but more than 40% of all of the vineyards in France were severely damaged. Uh, and uh, so as a result of that, they actually had to use uh, rootstocks from the United States uh, grapevines 
because they're, those are resistant to phylloxera. So I include that just kind of as a, an interesting historical note uh, and one of those examples where, uh, where insects or, or other animals like that have, uh, uh, have very seriously uh, impacted the production of a plant worldwide. I'm going to be spending the majority of my time today talking about muscadines. Uh, that is, again, Vitis rotundifolia. Those are native to the southeast United States. Uh, they are very well adapted here to our, our warm and humid conditions. Where you know, our European or, or American grapes really have a lot of difficulty growing. Uh, we don't have very good environmental conditions for the production of the, the traditional grape. Um, muscadines are fairly cold hardy. Uh, they can take temperatures down to zero degrees. Uh, we don't see that very often in the southern part of Mississippi. You may see it occasionally in the very extreme north part of the state, uh, but still relatively uncommon. Uh, so cold tolerant for most of the areas we have here in the state. Uh, and we are certainly known here in Mississippi for having high humidity. Uh, and the, the grape, the muscadine vines very well tolerate that, uh, and they tolerate some of the pests and diseases uh, that can be fairly serious problems for bunch grapes. Uh, so a very vigorous vine uh, in its sort of native state, uh, muscadines are dioecious. They have both male and female flowers on, on different plants. Uh, so the male flower is on one plant, the female flower is on another. Uh, now, there have been cultivars that have been developed that are self-fertile, that have both kinds of flowers, uh, and those are going to be very important as we talk about variety selection. Uh, they have very small greenish flowers. They're, they're born on dense uh, panicles, uh, and you tend to have fruit uh, you know, kind of growing on loose clusters, uh, anywhere from three to 40 grapes, just dependent on the variety. Uh, often I hear the, uh, the term scuppernong used for uh, muscadines. Uh, sometimes people will say that a, a bronze muscadine is a scuppernong, while as a, uh, the, the black varieties are muscadines. Scuppernong is, is a reference to the first variety uh, of muscadines that was cultivated. Uh, those were found growing wild. Uh, along uh, in, in uh, North Carolina, along the Scuppernong River uh, early in the 1800s. Uh, and so that's where that term comes from. Uh, and it really just kind of references that variety. Uh, though again, I, I have people, I have heard people use the term for Scuppernong and Muscadine fairly interchangeably. Uh, now, when we're gonna grow our Muscadines, we wanna make sure that we provide the right environment for them. Uh, we do want an area that's going to be in full sun. Uh, if you have your muscadines in an area where they get a little bit of shade, uh, they are going to produce uh, less fruit, uh, and generally those fruit are going to be smaller. Uh, so full sun is going to be uh, really important there, uh, and generally, you know, they're they're planted out in a, in an orchard where they don't have a lot of shade, uh, so that tends to work very well. Uh, we do, ideally do want a well-drained soil uh, with good water holding capacity. Uh, so, uh, you know, we don't have any drought conditions, but they aren't going to do very well in areas where we have, uh, you know, standing water uh, or floods or anything like that. Uh, just like a, a lot of the plants that we grow, they, they do not like wet feet. Uh, like most of the plants that we grow in our landscape, they do like a pH of around 6.5. Uh, just very slightly acidic, and um, you know, having them in an area with good air movement uh, is going to be really important as part of managing any disease issues we may have. Uh, and if you're in an area where you might get some uh, cold temperatures, having them in an elevated area uh, is going to assist with preventing any problems with cold damage. Uh, probably the most important thing as we're establishing a muscadine uh, uh, orchard or, or vineyard in our landscape uh, is to get our trellising done properly. Uh, and it really is best to go ahead and establish that trellis system 
before we plant the vine. So having that trellis system ready to go uh, before those vines actually get put in the ground. Uh, and we wanna make sure that that trellis system is strong enough to support uh, all of the weight of the vines and all of the weight of the fruit that are going to be produced. And we really wanna make sure that that's going to be durable so that it will last long enough uh, to have a, you know, long term muscadine production on it. Uh, you know, generally speaking, a number nine galvanized wire is what we're going to use for the actual trellis wire. Uh, galvanized metal arms uh, will work very well. Uh, I've seen a lot of them made of wood, uh, and it can be a fairly difficult process uh, to go back in and, uh, and try to repair any, any uh, uh, timber that's been used in the production of the trellis system. Uh, if you are going to use wood, you do want to make sure you use pressure treated wood. Uh, it is going to be out there in the elements for a long period of time, and you really want to make sure that it lasts. Um, generally speaking, we're going to set posts for our trellis about 20 feet apart. Uh, if you are going to have multiple rows, then you want to have about 12 feet between them. This gives you plenty of space to get in there and work on the vines, uh, and, uh, and that way they're not crowded. Uh, now, there are quite a, quite a few different ways that you can trellis muscadines. Uh, so I do wanna give the, the proviso that I'm, I'm really only gonna talk about a couple of those. There's a lot of variation uh, in ways that this is approached. Uh, but I'm going to talk about two systems that are probably the, you know, the best systems for a backyard muscadine uh, vine. Uh, so we are going to, with that, establish the plants uh, right next to the post. You'll see several, uh, several uh, descriptions uh, or several, uh, possibly some of the pictures that I'm using here, uh, where the muscadine is, is planted in the center between posts. Uh, that certainly is possible as well. So long as you give the vine support uh, in order to get up and get established on that trellis wire. Uh, so in establishing a trellis system, I'm going to talk first about the single, single wire trellis. Uh, it's possibly the, the simplest way to go, and I think really the best way to go uh, for a backyard muscadine vineyard. Uh, the most important thing is that we get our end posts right. Uh, those end posts are going to bear all of the weight of that muscadine vine. Uh, and we need to make sure that they're properly braced uh, so that, again, it, it can last for quite a while. Uh, and you want to start off with a post that's at least four inches in diameter, um, ideally somewhat larger than that. Uh, and you want to start off with an eight foot long post that you're going to put into the ground three feet. That is going to give it a, a significant amount of support uh, to make sure that it's not going to move once you go ahead and put it there. Uh, and you know that's going to be your end post for the vineyard, but you're going to want to go six feet further away from where the vines are going to be there and set an identical post uh, right there, six foot away, also eight foot long and three feet down into the ground. Uh, and that is going to be your bracing post uh, that's going to help that end post bear the weight of the vine. Uh, then you're going to want to put a four by four or similarly sized piece of wood uh, that is uh, longer than the posts are tall, so six foot. Uh, if you have them six foot apart, it's gonna be six foot. Um, and you're gonna use that to link those two posts that you put in the ground. Uh, and the second stage of that is you're gonna take that nine gauge wire that we've talked about, nine gauge galvanized wire, because uh, again, it's gonna be outside, we don't want it to rust. Uh, and we're going to run this from the top of the inside post to the bottom of the outside post. And what that's going to do is allow those two posts to really bear the weight of any of, uh, you know, bear quite a lot of weight and support each other uh, so that they can kind of share the load between those two posts. Um, and once you get that wire in, what you need to do is to tighten it and get it up to a pretty good high tension uh, is just to twist that wire against itself uh, and that'll get it to the point where it's really good and taut uh, and that allows the weight uh, or the you know, that weight that it's bearing to be transferred between those two posts. 
Um, those po the posts that you have should be spaced at 20 feet apart. Uh, they can be shorter, but I wouldn't put them any further apart than that. Uh, and you can use that same number nine galvanized wire for the actual trellis wire that the, the vine cordons are going to grow along. Uh, with a, a simple uh, tr single wire trellis, that's the one wire we're going to have going between the two, uh, two end posts. Um, and you want to staple that trellis wire in. Uh, you're usually going to use about a two and a half inch staple, so it's really good and secure. Uh, but you want that to be just shy of rigid. You want it to have a little bit of flex in it uh, just to prevent any possibility that it's going to break under that tension. Uh, and over the years, uh, you will get it to, uh, to loosen a little bit, so you may have to tighten it up year to year uh, and uh, just pay attention to it, make sure that it doesn't start to droop on you. Uh, now, a Geneva double curtain trellis is going to be set up for those end posts exactly the same. We have that support system there. Uh, really, the only thing we're going to do different is on those end posts, uh, we're going to put a T on them. Uh, so we're going to put those cross arms there. Uh, we can use, uh, uh, you know, good, uh, either a, again, galvanized metal is going to be the, the most reliable uh, item we can use for this. Uh, but we can use a four by four uh, pressure treated wood uh, to make up our, uh, our uh, cross arms. Uh, and then use, uh, as you kind of see in the picture there, uh, you want to get some two by fours to brace and help hold up those arms. Uh, and again, dr distribute that weight uh, back down to the uh, back down to our posts actually driven down into the ground. Uh, and that's going to make the cordons, the the vines that go along uh, those wires, uh, separate be separated out by four feet, which gives them plenty of room. Uh, again, you know, for a backyard, I really think that a, a single wire system is perfectly good. Um, but I do see a lot of these uh, these double curtain trellises out in backyards as well. Uh, now, as far as planting our uh, our grapevines, uh, generally we do want to transplant those during the winter while the plants are dormant. Uh, so, uh, generally, you know, in the same time we're planting other fruit trees, it's perfectly okay to go out there and plant our grapevines. Uh, so they're going to be dormant. Uh, and uh, one thing that is a little bit of an oddity for grapes, I normally tell people uh, that if you're going to plant, you want to make sure that you keep that, uh, uh, that line that they have in the container or that line that you see on the bare root. Uh, with a bare root plant, which I, I don't see quite as often uh, for muscadines, uh, you want to plant those about three inches deeper than the top roots. Spread, make sure you spread those roots out in the hole. Uh, with a container plant, you're going to put it about one inch deeper than it grew in the nursery. Uh, just to give it that good support, uh, make sure you backfill the hole uh, with good topsoil, uh, firm that soil around the root ball. And of course, it is always wise uh, when you're planting anything just to water it in. Uh, make sure that that root system is going to be have good connection with the water that's there in the soil. It's not going to wind up in the, under any uh, transplant stress. Um, I do often get asked if uh, we need to put any fertilization in the planting hole. Uh, I don't recommend any fertilization when you initially put the plant in. Again, we're going to be putting that in in the, the winter. Uh, so we can wait to fertilize until spring starts up, uh, and then we can fertilize based on soil testing uh, as the most reliable way to make sure that the grapevines are getting all of the resources that they need. Uh, now, what we do want to do. Uh, as we put the plant in the ground is we're going to do the initial pruning. Uh, and what we want to do is prune that vine down to a single stem. Um, so, and then we're actually going to remove all of the stem except for three buds. So we're not going to have a, a great deal of vine there. It's just going to be three buds. Um, one thing we do want to pay attention, and we're going to discuss this a little bit more when we talk about variety selection, uh, is we do want to make sure that we're going to have plants that are either self-pollinated uh, or that we have a pollinator present. Uh, so planting a female cultivar, we're going to have to plant that with a pollinizer within 25 feet to make sure uh, 
uh, that we're going to, uh, to be able to, to get pollinization and, and muscadine production. Uh, if you do have things uh, set out in rows uh, and the rows are, are 12 feet apart, uh, then every third row would need to be a self-fertile variety to make sure that you have, um, have uh, pollinizers there uh, for all of those female grapevines. Um, and uh, you know, sometimes people do mix uh, bunch grapes and muscadines. Unfortunately, other kinds of grape are not going to be an effective pollen source uh, for those muscadines. Uh, so training vines is going to be really important. We want to train them up to, uh, to grow along those cordons um, or, or to have their cordons grow along the, uh, the wire anyway. Uh, so once that bud breaks dormancy, it's going to have shoots emerge from the, those three or four buds. And what we're going to do is we're going to choose the shoot we like the most. Uh, and that's going to be our vine trunk. We're going to remove all of the other shoots uh, and we're going to provide it support as that shoot develops. Uh, so we can tie a, a good durable twine to a, a stake that's driven beside the plant. Uh, and just as the, uh, uh, and uh, we can you know, continue to tie it to that stake, uh, or we can tie the twine uh, back to an overhead wire um, and just continue to wrap our uh, grapevine or muscadine vine around that wire as it continues to grow uh, until it gets up to about 12 inches below the main wire that we're going to have there for our trellis. And then what we want to do is pinch off the tip. Uh, now, as we pinch off that tip, that is going to force the short, uh, the, the shoots right beneath that tip to start growing out. Uh, and those are going to become the vines that will grow along our trellis in a, in a single vine system. Uh, for the single wire trellis, those are going to become what actually grow along and become the permanent cordon vines. Uh, if we're doing a Geneva curtain uh, trellis where we have two, we're going to split, we're going to pinch off the top there at the top. It's going to go out those two feet uh, on either side, and then we're going to pinch it again and select two to actually grow along the wires. Uh, we want to train those to, to grow all the way down 10 feet in each direction. Uh, if we have the middle or, or uh, 10 feet in the direction of our, our post, if it's on, on the end, uh, and that's going to uh, meet the stem from its uh, closest neighboring vine. Uh, once we have all of those cordons established on the wire, of course, we're, you know, as, we're, uh, as it's continuing to grow, we may need to tie it to our, uh, our trellis wire uh, to keep it supported. Um, once the cordons are actually established, we're going to trim any lateral branches that form off the trunk. Uh, and we're going to allow lateral branches to develop along those cordons uh, because that's actually where we're going to see the fruit production of our muscadines. Uh, now, because we are tying our vines to something, uh, we do want to check periodically and just make sure uh, that we don't have a section where that tie uh, is, is really biting into the vine anywhere. Uh, we don't want it to girdle the cordon line, uh, cordon. Uh, or you know, put a lot of force on it because that can unfortunately uh, cause the, the death of that, uh, that vine. Uh, now we're gonna continue to want to prune and train uh, our muscadine vines year to year. Um, muscadines will actually fruit on new growth. So we wanna promote that new growth every year. Uh, in order to do that, we're going to every year uh, cut back to about two or three buds on each of the spurs or vines that come off of our main cordon vines. Um, the first winter after, they're, uh, uh, after they've established on the wire, that's when we're establishing those spurs. Uh, we get those side shoots that arise from the cordons during the, uh, the season. Uh, we're gonna select them about six inches apart. Uh, again, cut them back to two to four buds. Uh, and every year, fruiting wood is going to arise from those buds in the spring. And again, that's where we're going to get our, our actual fruit. Uh, so again, you know, in the dormant season, we're pruning down to uh, two to four buds. 
Uh, generally, we're going to do this no earlier than mid-January. We don't want to see any of that new growth uh, before we start getting our warmer temperatures in the spring. Um, but we can generally do that uh, you know, in the, the very, very early spring or, or what we might call the very, very late winter. Um, as the vine gets older, you are going to see clusters of spurs, uh, and we may need to thin that down uh, both to reduce the amount of fruiting wood. Uh, we don't want to overload the vines, uh, and we also want to keep it under control uh, just for our, you know, the level of labor uh, that we're going to need to put in to maintaining and pruning our vines. Uh, if we have any spurs that grow straight down, we want to remove those. Uh, and we also want to remove any spurs that form on the main trunk or the crotch where the, the main vines meet up. Uh, that's not a good place for them to form. Uh, and, you know, it may come about that a, a cordon uh, might get a disease or it might become weak. Uh, and if that happens, we can actually cut that cordon back uh, and train a shoot uh, that arises from the end of that cordon. Uh, train that along the vine and that can replace a cordon that has become damaged. Uh, and again, you know, any tendrils that wrap around cordons from the vines uh, or along the spurs, you want to remove those just in case uh, they might cause a girdling. Uh, they might essentially strangle the vine. We don't want to see that. Uh, irrigation can be very helpful for muscadines. Uh, and again, you know, in a backyard setting, you know, it's perfectly okay to, to not have irrigation for them all at all. They, they tend to do okay, um, but they will perform better if they are given some supplemental water, uh, particularly you know, as, we, uh, as we're establishing the vines. Uh, and drip irrigation is the best system to use to provide that additional water. Um, you know, normally when we're applying uh, drip irrigation, we apply that right along the ground, uh, and the the, you know, the the water just goes right to the root system. Uh, it's a little bit more convenient when we're talking about muscadines to lift that about a foot off the ground, uh, and we can just put a wire between our posts to support it, um, and put you know one gallon per hour emitters onto that uh, irrigation tubing uh, as a very effective way to deliver the water that we need. Uh, so we can put one emitter about two feet from the trunk of the vine in the first year. Uh, and because the plant's going to be really small, we want to make sure that water is getting right down to it. Uh, so we can use a piece of spaghetti tube, uh, just a small section, quarter inch line, uh, to direct water right to the base of the vine. Uh, but we can remove that after the first year, uh, once the vine gets a little bit more established. Um, and Secondly, in the second year, we can add another one gallon per hour emitter to the opposite side of the vine. Excuse me, that, that's in year three. Um, so second emitter in year three on the other side of the vine, again, about two feet away. Um, and, you know, muscadines can use up quite a lot of water. So, you know, six to eight gallons of water per day uh, will, uh, will give you a maximum yield. Uh, once we have harvested our muscadines, we can cut that down. Um, so, you know, once, once we've actually harvested, the vines have a little bit less water requirements, so we can just cut that down to the point where the vines aren't showing any symptoms of, uh, of water stress, you're not seeing any wilting during the day or any yellowing as a response to, uh, uh, to drought, uh, and we actually want to stop any irrigation in October uh, so that the vines can harden off uh, for, uh, for the uh, winter season. All right, so now we're going to talk a little bit about some varieties uh, of muscadine. These are perfect flowered varieties, uh, so they're not, they are self-fertile. Uh, and I've in included a number here uh, that, are, uh, that are widely used or, uh, uh, or would make good options. Uh, Carlos is very commonly used, uh, particularly for jam production or jelly production, um, has a really good vigorous vine um, and produces in the mid-season. Uh, Cowart is one that I've frequently seen, a uh, really good high quality uh, black muscadine with good disease resistance. 
Um, Isen is uh, used again for jellies and juices and wines. It has a very high yield uh, and really good disease resistance. I'm not going to mention all of these just in the interest of time. Uh, Triumph is a really good one that just tastes really good, uh, has good production, uh, does ripen fairly early in the season. Uh, now, there are a lot of female flower cultivars. Uh, big red, again, large red fruit, uh, given a, a really good relative name there. Um, black fry has really good uh, black fruit. One thing you will see on descriptions of uh, muscadine varieties is wet scar and dry scar. Uh, if it says it has a, a dry scar when it separates off from the vine, um, the, uh, if that stem kind of tears the, the tip of the fruit, uh, that's uh, you know, going to give a little bit, of, get a little bit of that juice out there, and that's called wet scar. If it separates without tearing, generally speaking, that's going to be a dry scar fruit. Um, fry is the the most popular bronze variety out there. Uh, ripens in mid mid season. Uh, it's probably you know if you're going to have a really cold winter, uh, not the best variety, but a really good variety for areas where it stays warmer. Uh, scarlet. Uh, was uh, developed in Georgia. It's uh, named because of uh, the, the color of its fruit, uh, really highly productive. Uh, of course, we go back to the, the old classic, the, classic, the Scuppernong variety, uh, really cold hardy, uh, you know, grew in North Carolina, so it's certainly going to grow further south here. Uh, really good flavor with bronze skin, it ripens in the mid-season. Uh, Summit is one that I do see quite a lot of, uh, it's a bronze dry scar with really good quality, uh, very sweet muscadine uh, that is both very productive and disease resistant. Uh, and another one is Supreme. Uh, that is a really large uh, black variety of muscadine. Uh, one thing I'm always looking for is muscadine with an edible skin because I don't like having to peel off the skins of my muscadines. Uh, it has a really good mid-season production. Uh, so those are varieties of muscadines, a lot of really good options there. Uh, I'm going to talk very briefly about bunch, uh, bunch grapes. Uh, these are, of course, grapevines. They, they bear their berries in a cluster, uh, and they should ripen all at the same time, so you can just harvest them you know, uniformly. Uh, and again, we really don't have a very good climate uh, for growing these bunch grapes. There are some varieties uh, that have been bred uh, to, uh, to tolerate conditions here. Uh, and probably more importantly, uh, for resistance to a, a disease called Pierce's disease. Uh, so Pierce's disease is a very serious condition uh, that can be fatal to the vines. Uh, so a lot of the common varieties are not going to grow here, um, but there are some bunch grape varieties that have been developed that are quite good. Uh, for North Mississippi, there's, there's Fredonia, which is a purple grape, and Niagara, which is a white grape, uh, both of which very good. Down here in South Mississippi, where I am, uh, Mid-South uh, is, a, is a good variety, uh, very resistant to Pierce's disease, a nice dark, uh, dark blue grape, uh, both good for fresh and uh, uh, making jellies, uh, harvest from July into August. Uh, Miss Blue and Miss Blank. Miss Blue is a, a blue variety. Miss Blank is a white variety. Um, very good flavor on both of them. Uh, and Blanc du Bois is another one with uh, very vigorous uh, vines, really good high yield. Uh, so again, you know, if you select one of these varieties, um, you're going to have better success with bunch grapes, um, but they are still not going to be quite as uh, productive. Uh, or you know, quite, uh, quite as good for a backyard uh, as a muscadine is going to be. Uh, one thing that I do think is extraordinary, extraordinarily critical for bunch grapes uh, is resistance to, uh, to particularly resistance to Pierce's disease, uh, but resistance to other diseases is important as well. Uh, we're fortunate with muscadines, they are far more resistant to a range of different diseases particularly Pierce's disease, uh, though it is still important that we do some, some fungicide treatments uh, and make sure we take care of you know, the basic you know, tasks of sanitation, cleaning up any grapes that fall on the ground, 
uh, making sure we get rid of any uh, leaves that have fallen. That we inspect our uh, grape, uh, our vines, muscadine or grape vines, uh, year to year to make sure that we're not leaving any potential disease material in the uh, in the vineyard from one year to another. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the different diseases that you may see on grapes or muscadines. Uh, Pierce's disease is probably the most important. Uh, it's caused by a bacterium called Xylella fastidiosa, uh, which uh, gets into the, the water conducting cells uh, of, the, uh, of the plant. And as a result, you can see that burning around the edge of leaves. Uh, it's spread by an insect called the glassy wing sharpshooter uh, that is native here. Uh, and we see some version of this uh, on a range of different plants. Uh, so uh, grapevines, muscadines are not the only plants that are affected by this bacterium. Uh, and you know, generally speaking, uh, it can be very difficult to manage uh, because resistance is really the most important tool there because there's really nothing we can spray uh, in order to, uh, to defend against this. Uh, now, for the, great, for the vines we do have, uh, for the muscadines we do have, uh, probably our most important or most common disease is bitter rot. Uh, it is caused by a fungus, uh, Meliconium fulgineum, uh, really usually is going to affect the berries and you can see those kind of shrunken, shriveled uh, berries that result you know, from that. Uh, it starts off as kind of a brownish spot on the, uh, on the fruit uh, those enlarge and uh, just destroy the berry. Uh, and the fruit do become more vulnerable to the berry as they mature. Uh, so we want to make sure, you know, any fallen berries that get on the ground, uh, that can be a reservoir for this year to year. Uh, so we want to make sure we're cleaning all of that up as a way to prevent reinfestation with bitter rot in the next year. Uh, black rot, another fungal, di uh, fungal disease, uh, will affect all basically all of the new season growth. You can see the sort of reddish brown spots there on the upper leaf surface. Uh, you can get cankers on stems and you would need to prune that away. Uh, and you'll also see fruit, uh, fruit spots starts off as kind of a small black scabby spot. Uh, again, the, the berries uh, will uh, fall to the ground. That can be a source for new infection. Uh, but if you see those sunken areas, the you know, dark discolored sunken areas on the vine, uh, that's certainly something that you would want to prune away and get rid of uh, to prevent that you know, being a source for, for infestation in the, previous, in the following year. Uh, angular leaf spot, another disease that shows up on a range of different uh, crops. Um, I'm going to quit saying all the scientific names. Uh, it can result in, excuse me, result in premature defoliation. I have an error there on my slide. Starts off as some really small brown spots on the upper leaf surface. Um, you wind up with them becoming lar larger and angular in their shape. Uh, th that can you know, lead to leaf drop. Uh, and then that, that fungi will survive over the winter on those infected leaves. Uh, macrophoma rot. Um, uh, you start off again, circular, light brown spots, turn black, slightly sunken, all on the berries. Uh, affected berries will generally drop from the vine. And again, sanitation is the most important tool that we have uh, in managing these problems. Uh, ripe rot, a very similar story. Um, a little bit easier to uh, see, I think. You start off with some uh, really uh, clear, circular, reddish brown spots. Uh, decay of the fruit and uh, you get pinkish spores uh, that will uh, show up on the surface of those rotten fruit. Uh, and again, you know, when we have uh, what, you know, if you have wet weather where you're having a lot of rain, high humidity, water splashing around, uh, that is when we're going to see a lot of these fungal diseases uh, showing up. Uh, kind of a, a, a very different disease is crown gall. Uh, it is caused by, caused by a bacterium, Agrobacterium tumefaciens, uh, and it results in swollen uh, tissue and on the trunk right, generally right above the soil line, uh, and will generally stunt the plant very seriously. 
Um, and the best way we can avoid crown gall is avoiding damage to the trunk uh, because it does need that damage in order to affect it. Unfortunately, uh, there's again, not a lot of treatment for crown gall. So often that's going to require the removal of that, uh, of that vine in, in order to, uh, to get rid of the disease. Uh, a very common abiotic problem that we see in muscadines is muscadine, is magnesium deficiency, excuse me. Um, they do have a relatively high requirement for magnesium. Um, so when we see, have a shortage, we, we tend to see this as what we'll call an intervenal chlorosis. Uh, so the plant yellows between the veins of the leaves. Uh, you may have fruit fall off. Uh, and to correct this, uh, the correct use is a correct use of Epsom salt. So Epsom salts are magnesium sulfate. Uh, so that is a, a good use of, of that uh, material uh, applied at about two to four ounces on one or two year old vines, four to six year ounces on older vines, uh, evenly on a three to six foot area and water it in. Um, if you have a, um, you know, if you're, you're soil testing, make sure that your pH is correct. Um, and if you do need to adjust your pH to make it more alkaline, if your pH has become too acidic, um, then you will use a lime product to do that. Uh, and very often you're gonna use what's called a dolomitic lime. Uh, and that dolomitic lime has magnesium in it, uh, which can also make sure uh, that we're applying all the magnesium that we need uh, for our muscadines. I'm going to talk about some insects that can be an issue in, uh, in muscadines and or grapevines for that matter too. Uh, first of these is the grape flea beetle. That's a picture of the adult up there on the top. Uh, they're called flea beetles because they do have enlarged, enlarged hind legs and they can jump. Uh, beetles about a quarter of an inch long. Uh, the immatures are kind of a plain dark brown, uh, about a third of an inch long when they're mature. Uh, and both of them will feed on the leaves. Uh, they leave a, a fairly distinctive uh, kind of shotgun uh, hole. Uh, so a lot of little small holes on the leaf is really distinctive for that kind of beetle feeding. Um, one thing that we can do to help manage these is remove any Virginia creeper uh, that might be around the area where we have our vines because uh, that is an important alternative host for this insect. Uh, aphids are our um, old favorite. Uh, you get a very large population of aphids very quickly um, because the aphid uh, the females uh, can reproduce uh, without mating uh, and produce more aphid females. So uh, populations can get very high very quickly, uh, lead to some stunting of the plant or yellowing of the plant. Um, if they have a lot of them, they do produce a, a sticky, sugary substance uh, that, uh, that uh, is unpleasant to work around and also allows sooty mold uh, or this kind of black fungal material to grow on the leaves. Uh, so we do want to control these. Aphids are not a, a very serious problem in muscadines, generally speaking. Uh, there are some biological controls that can be used for those, so ladybugs. Uh, and uh, green lace wings are very fond of eating aphids. Uh, so that is also a possibility for them. Uh, more seriously is the grape root borer. Uh, the picture up there at the top is the adult. And while it looks very much like a wasp, uh, is actually a moth. Uh, females will lay their eggs on the foliage or the trunk, uh, generally in the summer. Uh, and those eggs will, once the larvae hatch, they'll drop down to the ground uh, where they will then burrow into the roots. Uh, and if they are feeding near the crown, uh, that can cause some really serious uh, you know, reduction in the ability of that plant to take up nutrients. Uh, and you know, if you see, start to see your plants where they're wilting or not leafing out very well uh, in May and June, you can have a problem with grape root borers. Uh, one thing that can be done to help out with this is mounding soil over the base of the vines uh, if you know you have this uh, problem uh, and that will help prevent the larvae from getting down into the root zone. Uh, grape leaf hoppers are a, a, a very small insect 
uh, about an eighth of an inch long or so. Uh, they're called leaf hoppers. They, they do hop. Um, and uh, so if you get near them, they will jump away. Uh, both the adults and the uh, immatures feed on the leaves. Uh, and kind of give the leaf a little, kind of like a stippled appearance. Uh, and if they feed at the uh, base of the leaf, that can cause the leaves to drop off. Um, again, maybe not the most serious problem in the world, but if you start to see a lot of that stippling, that is something that you want to manage. Uh, stink bugs, always the, the bane of any gardener. Um, both the adults and the immatures will feed on fruit. They will, they will feed on other parts of the vines as well. Uh, they have a piercing sucking mouth part, kind of like a mosquito. They stick into the plant, suck out the sap. Um, that can cause the fruit to fall off or break uh, or just be pitted and unpleasant. Um, they can be a little bit difficult to manage simply because a lot of insecticides are not very effective uh, at getting rid of them. Um, but with the right insecticide selection, we can, uh, can take care of that problem. Uh, one that we do run into very frequently, <coughs> or an insect that we run into very frequently in muscadines uh, and other grapes would be wasps. Wasps are actually beneficial insects for us, uh, but if we, you know, we don't really necessarily want to encounter them while we're uh, you know, trying to harvest our fruit. Uh, so, you know, any fallen fruit or rotting fruit that might be around, uh, we can remove those. Uh, and that will be uh, less attractive to wasps uh, you know, to be in that area, and that will help. And you only want to use a control for wasps uh, if they pose a, a really serious stinging hazard. You know, if you're allergic, certainly something to be aware of. Uh, but we want to keep them around. They, you know, in some cases, they're hunting for things that we want them to eat. Uh, in some cases, some wasps have, have roles in pollination. Uh, so very important to keep around. Uh, so I appreciate your uh, time and attention today. Uh, again, if you have any questions and you've been watching on YouTube, I do encourage you uh, just uh, write, go ahead down into the comments section, write your question in, uh, and I will be very happy to be able to answer that uh, and have a very good day and uh, hopefully a very good weekend.